And now the last talk before the panel is by Kirchin. Hello, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. All right, I'll try to power through this since we're short on time. So, hello everyone. As most of you already know, I'm Kieran Atreides, and today I'll be discussing a cognitive bias detection study that David J. Kelly and I ran for a component of the systems that we're building. I will preface this by pointing out that we had settled for a small sample size of participants, so we could only determine statistical significance on a subset of the factors we had originally planned to analyze. As it turned out, Quite a lot of people claim to want cognitive bias detection, and quite a lot of those people are too lazy to participate when given the opportunity. The average volunteer required over 10 hours split between study time for the 188 cognitive biases in the Cognitive Bias Codex from 2016 and performance of the task, which consisted of yes, maybe, or no detection responses for 24 categories of cognitive bias on each of 50 text samples from folks giving us a total of 1,200 data points per volunteer. The choice of looking for positive agreement rather than all agreement was due to the known phenomena of how perspective binds and blinds, as Jonathan Haidt put it, meaning that negative detection agreements could also indicate a shared gap rather than a shared absence of such cognitive biases. To the best of my knowledge, no one has yet created a robust benchmark for the detection of cognitive biases in text, covering full spread of possible biases. We had to use a pairwise positive human consensus as a proxy in lieu of a better option. This method involves comparing all possible pairs of participants, checking for such consensus by applying the 1200 data point matrix of answers for direct comparison between each pairing. This method would become very cumbersome for a larger sample size, as the number of possible pairs would explode to 465 at a sample size of 30 participants plus one detection system. However, for a small sample size, this pairwise comparison offered greater detail for examination. As you can see, for the full spectrum of cognitive biases being examined, the human average score for our sample was 16.5%, and the detection system's average score was 17.2%, as calculated by the same pairwise comparison. In figure two, the number of positive agreements for each pair was divided by the lowest number of positive detections between the two to compare what fraction of total positive detections were agreed upon for each. In this, the system scored below the human average, but still above the lowest scoring. This performance gap is discussed later in the paper as well. These matrices offered several sets of figures to help validate the process of weighing the contributions of every volunteer for the purpose of recombining them into a single collective set of detections in line with collective intelligence. We used a combination of normalization methods to reduce the noise from the small sample size, resulting in a collective intelligence detection set based on the data from our volunteers with a positive agreement matrix score of 37.7% over the full spectrum, up from the previous individual high score of 24.5% among our volunteers. This step didn't include the detection system data, as the purpose was to establish a human collective intelligence to function as our baseline proxy for a ground truth of cognitive bias detections. We apply that collective intelligence toward the evaluation of the detection system in the subsequent steps. The result of collective detection, the detection set, uh, only dipped below the median on a single category, more closely paralleling the median human on some categories and the detection system on others. This offered significant insight into categories where the detection system was underperforming and more data may be required. It also highlighted categories of cognitive bias that fewer but more diligent and accurate individuals may pick up on, such as our volunteer with the highest consensus scores of any individual. When the full spectrum of categories was broken down into true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives, then the humans and the detection system looked highly similar and almost random. However, 
lacking a more robust prior benchmark, and since this method ignored categorical performance differences in detecting different types of cognitive bias, this could only be used qualitatively for comparison in further steps. We then reduced the scope under examination to 18 of the 24 total categories where the detection system appeared to have sufficient data to operate. Across this subset, the system's detection performance tracked much more closely with that of the top performing human volunteer, who in turn performed more significantly below the collective detection set than the system performed below them. Within this new scope, a clear distinction also emerged between the median human volunteer and the detection system, with the median human numbers remaining largely consistent at negative 1.7%, but showing an 8.5% improvement in the detection system for a net difference of just over 10%. Keep in mind that these are the very earliest tests and figures, so numerous methods of optimization, filtering, and additional data can be applied to drive further research forward. It would also be significantly helpful to get international organizations to participate in such uh, cognitive bias research, as that activity has remained conspicuously absent at scale. Taking our subset of 18 performant categories, we re-ran the consensus matrix numbers again. Uh, the numbers remained highly consistent among our volunteers when examined from these angles, but the detection system score exceeded the average volunteer in both cases this time. The positive agreement score of the system was exceeded only by the top performing volunteer and the collective. The score factoring in the common detection count from the system was exceeded only by the top two performing volunteers and the collective. The same matrix calculations were then applied to the collective detection set for comparison. Uh, this can also be considered as comparing the contributing factors of that collective to both the collective as a whole and the detection system that is separate from us. As collective intelligence researchers might expect, the collective reliably outperforms even the best individual humans, giving us a higher bar to aim for in further research. More diverse ways of examining the numbers can also contribute new perspectives, serving to further reduce the bias inherent to any one method or subset of methods used in analysis. The purpose of this first phase was to establish a collective detection set among our volunteers, which would then serve as a proxy in lieu of a more robust ground truth. The detection system was never trained on any of the data from our volunteers, so human and system detections are entirely separate. But across the subset of performance categories, they also proved markedly consistent in different ways. As you can see, the detection system largely bounced between the levels of detection shown by the highest performer and that of the median volunteer, only notably exceeding the collective proxy for ground truth twice, one of which the top performer also exceeded. The top performer also performed notably better on some categories than others, scoring below the median in four of them, closely parallel to the detection system in that portion. To put this performance of even the earliest tested version of the detection system into a real world financial context, we calculated the cost and time difference using Seattle's minimum wage for the hourly rate. Even without any optimization of the detection system, the time difference was more than 4,100% improvement and a 3% performance improvement above the average human. Top performing humans and collective intelligence do still outperform the system now, but they also come at a 8,500% and 21,000% time cost respectively, with far greater hourly costs also applied to that time. These are also the numbers for the full spectrum, not the higher performance subset. A few different methods of optimization for the detection system are then considered in the impacts on the overall process are estimated. Methods such as parallel processing can accelerate the overall process at the cost of a higher equivalent hourly rate for the system, but offer additional options that may appeal to specific use cases. Other more general methods of optimization don't necessarily pose such trade-offs. 
For phase two of the study, we ran a set of 150 open-ended questions through the top five performing language models at the time. The subsequent set of 150 answers from each LLM created a data set where cognitive bias detection could be run on the LLM outputs and compared to our results from the previous phase. This process showed significant similarities as well as several notable differences between the LLMs, humans, and the detection system. As you can see, the detection system noted considerably lower levels of cognitive bias in the human quotes used in phase one than it did for the answers provided by the LLMs across most categories, with only one category where human bias remained above the bias detected from LLMs. That particular category includes stereotypical bias and implicit stereotypes, among others. This observed reduction may also be attributed to the soft and hard forms of contamination discussed later in the paper. The top human and collective detection rates from the previous phase are also overlaid on the LLM detection scoring data. In some of these categories, the top human and collective detection rates much more closely parallel the rates of detection system checking LLM generated data than those of the detection system checking human generated data. This may well be because the patterns of cognitive biases being regurgitated by LLMs are more systematically recognizable than those produced by individual humans, but further research is required to prove this conclusively. Two types of model contamination were considered in this phase, with one being the hard rejection of a question resulting from a particular form of fraud in the AI industry, often referred to as guardrails. GPT-4 showed the highest incidence of this type of contamination at the time, rejecting over 19% of questions. Another type referred to here as soft contamination was only significantly demonstrated by a single model, where extremely obvious canned responses were appended to the start of an answer, but the system continued to actually answer the question thereafter. Claude showed this strong tendency to append canned responses, doing so for more than 67% of all questions. There are numerous directions that future research can take from this point onward, and our team is integrating these cognitive bias detection capacities in the ICOM cognitive architecture, where performance can substantially and iteratively improve relative to phases one and two, where it operated as a standalone the quality, volume, and contextual connectome with data being considered are all opportunities for significant improvement in subsequent implementations and further study phases. Other planned future work includes applying cognitive bias detection with confidence ratings for each specific cognitive bias, as well as tracking how those patterns of detection unfold over time in periodic and potentially predictable sequences. Once the next phases are completed, then it may also become possible to model the cognitive bias expression patterns of an individual human by taking time series format interactions of how they express cognitive biases over time, utilizing information from sequential interactions such as interview questions. Once such human patterns of cognitive bias expression over time are established, the same process could be applied to analyze extended sequential interactions with various AI systems over time. One of the more exciting possibilities that may be explored once patterns of cognitive bias expression can be modeled to a high degree of fidelity for any given individual human is a greatly improved ability to model that individual human decision-making process. Downstream applications of that capacity could include high-fidelity personal proxies, to handle everyday decision-making, bringing up time for individuals, as well as running simulations to compare many individuals in various tasks, roles, contexts, and ethical dilemmas. High fidelity personal proxies uh, are sorry, of how, particular- How much longer is uh, your talk? Almost done. Okay, I'm almost, <laughs> please go ahead. Um, high fidelity personal proxies are of particular interest to both individuals and governance efforts even up to the level of implementing first actual democracy. Uh, the simulations making use of such high fidelity personal proxies and novel der derivatives thereof could significantly aid scientific research as well as the consideration 
of branching counterfactual possibilities for more accurate predictive capacities broadly. Such predictive capacities could also prove far more stable across the dimension of time than the rapidly deteriorating options available today. And finally, thank you for your time, and I hope everyone enjoys Beta 24 and AGI 24 this year. Thank you very much. Any questions? No? All right. I guess 